This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 332 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Total Saddle Fit and Mill Creek Spreaders. Eliza Signa Rom shares her amazing time training in Germany with Oliver Ulrich and Total Saddle Fit trainer tip on effective communication with Christina Vinios. Listen in. Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. You know, sometimes uh, Meredith says that I should say from Rockwood, Ontario, Canada. But oh, your accent gives that, you away, Phil. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're Canadian. Canadian. We all know you're Canadian. Canadian. Right. You've <laughs> let like... us know. I said I've been doing this for long enough that <laughs> yeah, I don't right. have to do that. <laughs> no, I think we're good. I think we're, we're good now. Hi, guys. How are you tonight? Doing great. Doing pretty good. Good. We're recording a little bit early um, this week because I'm heading uh, myself to the regional championships. Woo-hoo. So I know. Is Woo-hoo. that your region, though? I don't understand how you guys can just decide to go to a different region. Well, so because we live in the United States of America and it's a huge place. Um, we I think can... Canada's bigger, so I don't want to hear <laughs> that. Bigger. But like everybody lives in Toronto, so it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we... Be very careful. Yes. Very careful. The people in Victoria are really upset Sorry. right now. <laughs> I love Canada. And I actually, I, I, yeah, never mind. Anyways, we can actually choose in the U.S. Um, if you're early enough, I think it's by July 1st, if you decide like you're, you're significantly closer or want to go to a different region. You can do that, actually, in the U.S. You just have to be sort of organized about it. So for us, we had the Region 2 Championships happened a couple weeks ago in Michigan. And I felt like I was a little concerned about the weather. The venue apparently was very nice, but it was an outside venue. And Michigan can have the tendency to be really wet in September. And Kentucky is typically really still warm. So... um, It was actually a little bit closer for us to go to St. Louis. Actually, we could have gone to three different venues, St. Louis, uh, Michigan, Lexington, Virginia, which is about the same hall to St. Louis, or Atlanta, Georgia, which is, again, all those are all within seven hours. So I just picked St. Louis. I, I like the venue. It's an inside venue. So um, I, we all are the, able to... All the tests will be written inside? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all the tests. Actually, the whole oh, venue. Really? You don't even have to leave the... Like, go outside. So... Our region two regionals last year was it rained so much and it was so cold. I just didn't even want to deal with it. <laughs> so we're going to St. Louis where we're going to be inside and there's no there's no weather component um, for us. Okay. So that was just a that was just something we decided as a team and uh, from a from a distance standpoint, it was actually all equidistant. That's a long way of saying that Reese is a wimp and she wants to be inside. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, for not sure. Not that we blame you, Reese. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whew, I think. Well, you know, again, we're trying to set our horses up for the the best success we can. And whew, if you were here at the regionals last year, and it rained like oh, I don't even remember. It it just rained and rained, and it was muddy everywhere. It was awful, and it was really hard to ride and prepare your horse. So uh, we we yeah, we took the wimpy route, and uh, there's no weather component where we're going. So. I'm looking forward to it, though. It's going to be fun. Right. I hope we're going to have a little time and to sightsee a little in St. Louis. And uh, I think it should be really a great weekend. So I'm looking forward to it. Good luck. Thanks. We're doing the third level and the third level freestyle. So it should be, should uh, be fun. So you yeah. might be able to show next year at, at Nationals. Or well, this also, year, yeah. I guess, it's later yeah, on this year. Yeah, Nationals are later on here in Lexington. And I have not personally ridden there yet. And uh, it would be fantastic. So that's the goal. That's the, the plan with Elin Court. Uh, it would be kind of cool to go to two different national championships in one year. So fingers crossed. So it should be fun. No matter what. It will be a good time. Cool. Sounds cool. terrific. Hey, I got some news for you guys. We have an announcement to make. And this announcement, uh, maybe... We can get some help of some of the Dressage Radio Show listeners. Uh, we are going to be, we're very excited about this, and or we're crazy. I'm not sure which. My wife thinks we're crazy, <laughs> but uh, she thinks I'm crazy. She, she likes you guys. Uh, so, oh. <laughs> okay. You like her too. Yeah. So, very, so, we are going to be doing the first ever 
And it's sponsored by Weatherbeta, our friends at Weatherbeta, 12-hour holiday radiothon on Cyber Monday, which is November the 30th. That's right. We're going to be on the air live for 12 hours from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Dr. Wendy Ying is going to come up and be in the studio with me. Uh, Wendy and I are going to be live the whole 12 hours, and then we're going to be rotating all the hosts from the from the radio shows for an hour during the day. So you guys are going to come in for an hour. Uh, yeah. Sometime during that day, we're putting the schedule together now. And what we want is listeners. We're going to be able to take live callers, and we're going to have we're going to have top riders from the dressage world calling in. And what the idea is, it's going to be a holiday party. So get the eggnog out. We want everybody telling us about their favorite Christmas memories that maybe involve a horse. So people are going to call in. We're going to. I'm going to work on getting. Char- I'm putting it out to the universe. I'm going to work on getting Charlotte Dietrich Dan to call in. <gasps> So we'll try and get her to call in. Oh we'll my try, God! We'll try and so get uh, we'll try and get the top writers here from Canada and the United States to call in, and then we want our listeners to call in and tell us about their favorite holiday memories. We have a whole bunch of things planned throughout the day. We're going to be giving away a prize every hour, all day long, and then we're going to have a big prize at the end of the day. Uh, so you're going to want to pay attention to that all day. Uh, Reese and Philip are going to join us. It should be. It's just going to be a big party, and it's something we really hope becomes an annual event. Uh, I don't know that anybody's ever done it like this before. It'll be live, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put it out, recorded all twelve hours. But we're also going to break up the different hours, so we'll break up the dressage hour, and we'll put it out on your show feed that week too. So oh, okay, people cool. who don't awesome. get to listen live can hear you guys on on the live radio show. Time. That's always nerve wracking. Fantastic, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Phil be. gets nervous on this live show. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to be on with Wendy and I and Reese. It should be fine. <laughs> yeah, it'll be. It'll all be okay. Jennifer's yeah. going. He said he would quit in the beginning. He at least softened to this, Glenn. He yeah, said it in the true. beginning. Yeah, that's I've been live a couple of times. Yeah. You know who has it rough is Jennifer is the only producer that can handle the calls at this point. So we're trying to get somebody else trained or she's not going to have a break for 12 hours. Oh, Oh my gosh. Uh, So we're going to try and get somebody trained up quick. I'm bowing to Jen right now. Woo. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to be tired at the end of the day. But it should be. I mean. I'm just looking forward to this. I think it's going to be a riot. We're going to play Christmas music from some of our favorite independent equestrian musicians. Uh, we're we're just gonna we're gonna put, we're gonna play a little trivia games along the day. Uh, we're also going to have six charities, uh, horse uh, charities, uh, adoption agencies that are going to come on throughout the day to uh, tell us about one particular horse that's up for for holiday adoption. So cool. we're going to highlight some of those all day long. It's just going to be a, a fun and we're doing all different hours we're doing endurance hour eventing hour we're uh we're covering driving and all the different disciplines jumping and we're going to have all the top riders that we can get to call in and talk about the holidays with us so cool. uh, maybe, awesome yep sounds I, awesome it should be a riot that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. It'll and, be fun. And thanks to Weatherbeater for taking the title sponsorship. They're the ones that are making this possible. Uh, and also to horselovers.com uh, is also sponsoring that for the entire day. So uh, good for them, and, and thank you to them for joining in. Fantastic. Well, very cool. Well, right after this commercial from Mill Creek Spreaders, we are going to go to interview with Eliza sidner Rom, and we're going to talk about her trip to Germany. Well, coming up next is a friend of ours. You've heard her here on the show before. Her name is Tracy Knoll, and she is from Mill Creek Spreaders. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Glenn. And Thanks of course, for having me back. No problem. And, of course, Mill Creek Spreaders are the finest manure spreaders in the world. Definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, you, you know, basically, if you're going to have to buy a new manure spreader, just don't look at anything else. Just go to Mill Creek. Look at Mill Creek. It's going to last you a long time. You're not going to be disappointed. They're they're made here in the United States, and they're finely crafted, and they're the best out there. So just don't look at the other stuff. Look at Mill Creek. But now you guys are are really having – it's your 30th anniversary. By the way, I didn't realize Mill Creek was around for 30 years. Yes, we have been. We're really proud of that, too. We were um, among the first to make compact and horse spreaders, and we were the first, definitely the first to make one specifically geared for horse people with the best quality features that we could build in. We were the first to do that. So we have um, continually upgraded our stuff, though. We are actually on our fifth edition 
um, of the 27 plus, which is our most popular model. That's the one for one to four horses, the original size. And yes, yeah, our fifth generation of those spreaders that we're on because we have kept adding things or taking away, or what have adding things mainly and improving on the original design since 1985. So we're very proud of that because, believe it or not, there's a few out there that are still being made the same way for like the last 20 years. So, oh, and the problem you guys have is you you there's something in wholesale uh, and manufacturing called planned obsolescence. And that is yes. you plan on your product only lasting a couple of years, so they have to buy it over and over and over again. The problem you guys got is there are people out there with the original 30-year-old spreaders that are still using them because they don't break. And, God, and Yes, we've heard yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> That's bad for you guys. I mean, you're making a product that lasts forever. So I know. And then what did we do? We came out with a stainless steel with a lifetime warranty. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're we're. What is this sweepstakes? What can people do, and what's happening? Okay, well, it's our like I said, it's our thirtieth anniversary sweepstakes. So of course, we wanted to celebrate, and we are giving away our very top of the line spreader, which is a twenty seven plus, our most popular size, in the stainless steel. So the twenty seven plus SS spreader, and as I mentioned, that does have a lifetime warranty against floor and body rust through. So you are not going to find anything. There is no other company making stainless steel compact manure spreaders. They are the absolute best you will, you will find anywhere. This is you the one you need, Helena. So pay attention. You need to be entering yes. the sweepstakes. <laughs> this is the size yeah. you pretty much the ultimate. If you've got manure to dispose of, this is the ultimate machine. So, yes, we're giving one away. And to enter the sweepstakes, people need to go um, to our Facebook page. You can, you can click there. There's a number of places where the link is available on the tab or in one of our posts or um so yeah, you can. Um, there's also a link on our website if you just want to go to www.milkcreekspreaders.com. You'll find the link to the sweepstakes there. So that's another way to get to it. Um, and we have a simple entry form. We just ask for your email address. It's you know one email per entry, um, and your name and your shipping address. Um, it's available to people in the continental U.S. and District of Columbia. We're very sorry. We cannot ship you a spreader if you're in Japan. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, they're a little um, too big for that. Yeah, a little too big. Yeah. UPS we, we doesn't do like have, that um, size. We, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we actually have a very active distributor in the U.K., so you can get them there. But, um, yeah, for the sweepstakes, it's the continental U.S. Um, and we just uh, um, we'd love to know how you found out about the sweepstakes. It could be from here. And we also ask um, just um, why do you want a Mill Creek spreader? We get the most wonderful answers for that. Um, a lot of people say because we've heard they're the best, and that's what we like to hear from folks. A lot of people say I've wanted one for a long time, or my neighbor has one and thinks it's wonderful. Um, we get some uh, some interesting answers from folks that are you know a little aged or infirm and would really like a, a spreader to help them out in their farm, which we certainly can appreciate because they definitely make life easier. So it's we enjoy seeing those answers, um, and we appreciate it whenever we get them. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we strongly encourage people to enter. You've got until October 12th. That's when we'll close the, the entries. So go right ahead. All right, very good, Helena. You, know, you could be spreading that manure in that back field of yours back there. You mean uh, with something other than my two hands? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be kind of awesome. People say that. People say that. I'd be a whole lot better. They say stuff like it would be a lot better than my pitchfork and wheelbarrow. Exactly. I'm yeah. I'm spreading it by hand. So. <laughs> we, I, you know, I, I think we actually owned a Mill Creek at one point. You know, well, the problem is they get with, with the older ones that were 30 years old is they, they, they get beat up, but they still work. Uh, you know, so yep, you're you're still it. using them. You can't even read the labels on them anymore, and people are still out there <laughs> using them, and uh, that's what happens. But we, now you have all different sizes from one horse to yes, to twenty horses. You have all different sizes. Plus twenty, yeah, yeah, twenty plus. We do have all different sizes, and um, most of them are available in the stainless steel. The two smallest are um, our mini spreaders, as we call them. The fifteen and the twenty-two are galvanized steel. Um, so those are those are the sort of entry level models, and we've been selling quite a few of the 22s lately. Uh, those definitely have their place. They are they are like I said. Definitely, well, you can pull them with um, a lawn economy. with a lawn tractor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, actually, number our four of our models you can pull with the, with a lawn tractor. So 
Yeah, they're pretty good that way. Um, when you get to the midsize, then you have a choice of, you know, a bigger tractor or with, you can do, still do ground drive or PTO. When you get to the really big ones, you have to have a big tractor and a PTO. Right. So we've got, we've got one for practically the, every size. The ground drive ones, though, you can use with a pickup truck some of those sizes too, right? Um, I guess you could, yeah. Yeah, we used to do that all the time. <laughs> Trust me, you can do that because we used to do it all the time. I'm sure. As well, then we yeah. have people who rig them to be horse drawn too. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Put yep, those horses to work, Helena. They need a job. Put the horses to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hitch them up. <laughs> yeah, they need a job. They're like the rest of the millennials. They don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. I, I know I had to throw that in there. It was just low hanging fruit. It was. It was there. Well, Tracy, it there. it's MillCreekSpreaders.com, right? Yes. Yep. MillCreekSpreaders.com. And, and we'll put a link to it in our show notes. And also, we'll put a link uh, on our Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll look forward to talking to you again. Well, it is our pleasure this evening to have Eliza, Eliza Sidner Rahm, USDF bronze, silver, and gold medalist, and certified instructor through fourth level on the show. Eliza, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, this is your uh, your performance again. You came on a, a, about a year ago, I think. So we're super excited to have you back. And um, we have been following you because you won one of the Young Dressage Horse Trainer Conferences grants to train with Oliver Ulrich in Germany. And we wanted to just talk to you about the whole experience. So uh, can you yeah. get started? Yeah, so the um, Young Dressage Horse Trainer Symposium, where I met Phil and have enjoyed spending time with Reese every year, um, is this awesome event, as you probably all know, that Scott Hassler has put on with uh, the Malones, who sponsor it every year. And so this past year was the 10th anniversary, and they gave out um, six $5,000 grants to train with the different clinicians that have taught it over the years. So I won the one to go train with Oliver Ulrich or Ollie Ulrich um, at his barn in Germany. And they said, uh, if you apply to train with one of the German trainers, then they will provide you with horses to ride. And I thought, sweet, I'll do that. <laughs> so, um, and he did. He totally did. He let me ride some unbelievable horses. So it was great. Um, my complicating factor is that I have a little boy who is now. <laughs> 20 months old, was 18 months old when we went to Germany. And so I said in my application, you know, we come as a package deal. And so my husband can work remotely wherever there's internet. So he came with me and Daniel, my son came with me and I went to the barn and rode all morning and Jonathan hung out with Daniel. And then in the afternoon I hung out with Daniel and Jonathan worked into the night. So it actually worked out really well. Um, and that's awesome. We I mean, you have, to, you so have to sort horrible. of fit your life around the riding, right? Because you can't just sort of you know, yeah. pick up and leave the family. And, and that's, uh, that's great how you worked it out to get, to get your whole family over there and, and, uh, and, you know, and still ride and still do a whole bunch of really fun stuff, I think. Yeah. And it was actually a really awesome experience for our family. And um, so, yeah, it, it really worked out really well. Um, and we were there for about a month. So yeah, you guys, we, I mean, I kept seeing on Facebook, I mean, you guys look like you traveled and you did a lot of other stuff other than the horses, right? We did. So while I was there, the World Young Horse Championships in Fairden happened, and then the European Championships in Aachen happened. So I had to go to both of those, of course, Yes. because um, I was pretty close to both of those. And then um, after my time at Ollie's ended, or my money ended, <laughs> um, <laughs> then we took a week as a family to go um, do a little vacationing. So we went through Prague and then into Vienna and we got to see a performance at the Spanish riding school oh. and then come home. So yeah, it was really, really an awesome once in a lifetime trip. Oh, that's fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the training. What did, what did you learn and what was it like to be there? So he has a busy uh, training stable um, sort of in between Munster and Osnabrück in Northern Germany and he and his assistant trainer and his wife all train out of there. Um, so they have about 30 to 35 horses. Um, so it's busy, but it's not, you know, too factory like, um, and he has a 20 by 40 indoor arena and then a beautiful outdoor 
arena and um, lots of really nice horses, lots of FEI horses. And he is the coach for the U25, the under-25 team for Germany. Um, and he also coaches a lot of the young horse riders that compete in the four, five, and six-year-old classes. And then he also coaches quite a few of the FEI young riders. So it's very busy and it's quite varied with different ages of horses, but a lot of FEI horses. And then he does quite a lot of trailer in lessons as well. Since he's the U25 coach, um, he taught me a little bit about how that works, where he has the contract to be the U25 coach. And so therefore they can come and take a lesson with him at a reduced cost because he gets paid also by the German Federation. Um, and that was really interesting to me, the way their whole pipeline program works. Because as we know, the Germans are definitely one of the best, if not the best in the world at producing these riders and trainers. And Ali is definitely a product of that system. He competed himself in the ponies and then in juniors, et cetera, both in eventing and dressage. And he really likes coaching uh, the juniors and the under 25 uh, young riders. And so uh, it's, it's really interesting to see how that works and they make it quite doable. Like the, if you were a U25 rider and you came and had a lesson with him or an FEI young rider, um, it was like 50 euros for a lesson. And so, you know, it, it, it makes it really quite doable for people to come if they're close enough, obviously. And of course, Germany has the benefit of being a very small country, unlike us, but, um, it's, it's just interesting to see that system in action. And he's a big part of, of all their, programs there very involved in the young horses and the young riders and all the way up to the grand prix riders so how many how many would you say how many riders came and sort of took advantage of that program um quite a lot i'm not exactly sure how it works like if you have to be considered you know on the a team or the b team or something or the long list or however they describe it um, in order to take advantage of that. But he also did a couple training days at Varendorf at the DOKR there. Um, and so I would say quite a few. Um, there were at least, you know, like I said, I wasn't always there in the afternoons. In the afternoons was when he had a lot of lessons. But I would say at least two trailer and lessons a day. Um, and then there are a few riders that board their horses there and keep their horses in training with him. Charlotte uh, Maria Sherman, who won the U25 uh, championships last year, she and her stallion Burlington uh, stay there at his place and train with him on a regular basis, as do, uh, let's see, two other Germans, two Swiss, one U25 rider and one junior rider stay there all the time. Um, so it's there were quite a lot that that I got to see. That's yeah, fantastic. sounds like quite a few. Yeah. So Eliza, tell tell us a little bit about what horses you were riding, um, you know, age and what sort of level and, and some of the stuff that you were working on. Yeah. So he was very generous in letting me ride um, a lot of horses and some really fantastic horses, all really fantastic horses. Um, Every day, pretty much, I rode um, a very nice Australian gelding named Four Seasons, who's a 10-year-old by First Piccolo out of a macho mother um, who does all the Grand Prix. And Ollie is competing him at the I-2 and at the Grand Prix now. Um, and he's preparing him for his owner, who will do the U-25 Grand Prix with him eventually. Um, so I got to ride him pretty much every day. And then... Um, then it was different every day. I usually rode two or three horses. Um, and I rode another gelding pretty regularly, a, an eight year old Sir Donner Hall that was schooling a uh, little bits of everything from the Grand Prix, but very solid. I won horse. He was really fantastic horse. He had some confirmational difficulties, but really an unbelievable mover in the trot, uh, which is fun to feel and really talented for the Piazza Passage. Uh, I got to ride Floris Count, who's a pretty well-known stallion, um, who had just come back to Ollie. He was second last year, I believe, in the Nürnberger Bert Pokal, their like, developing pre-St. George championships. And then he is a very popular breeding stallion, so he did a lot of breeding. And he had just come back to Ollie to be prepared for their like developing Grand Prix horse 
classes this year. So I got to ride him a few times, which was absolutely amazing. He is an incredible animal um, and really a sweetheart. And then a um, couple other SEI horses that I got to sit on here and there. Um, and then there were a couple young horses that I got to ride pretty regularly. A really nice four-year-old first in ball gelding. Um, and then a very nice four-year-old mare who was by Flores Count. Um, and then a few sort of in between, you know, sort of like a six-year-old third level horse and an older horse that had difficulty with the changes. Um, so it was a nice mixture and he definitely was pretty incredible. All he was about letting me sit on the, the FEI horses and really be able to feel the piazza and the passage and the changes and the pirouettes. And, um, so that was really invaluable because it's one thing to talk about it and watch it and try to train it on your own horses. But then sometimes to feel, especially for me, the one to be and the transitions between the Piaf and Passage, I think, oh, that is what everyone's talking about. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. really cool. You know, yeah. you can read about it all you want and you can watch it all you want. But <laughs> until you feel it, I think you you just don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> so true. It's so true. So, Eliza, I mean, tell us, what were some of your favorite sort of takeaway training tips from being there? Yeah, uh, one of the things that I think he is quite good at is really getting horses to um, really be powerful and expressive um, in terms of really pushing from behind and getting a very steady and very even connection into the contact. Um, and the thing that surprised me or maybe didn't surprise me, but it took me a little while to get used to is that the contact of a lot of the horses was quite a lot stronger than what I was used to. But um, what I found eventually is that I often am in search of lightness and that is not necessarily, I mean, that is a goal that a lot of us have in training dressage horses, but um, I came to think of it more that my goal should be elasticity and suppleness rather than thinking so much about lightness and the weight of the rain. Because at the beginning, a lot of times I thought, oh my God, these horses are so strong. They take so much contact. But because they push so much from behind and they, they then need you to help supple them. And eventually by the end of the ride, I would say that they were in self-carriage and they were fairly light. but very, very into the hand, really seeking the contact at all times, which allows you to give the kind of half halts you need to give for these very, very collected movements like the off and passage and pirouettes, um, which when you focus more on just the end goal of lightness, sometimes I feel like you don't really have them seeking you, you know, and you can't half halt a horse that isn't there in the contact. And so that was one of the big takeaways for me that in order to really ride with a lot of power and expression and a lot of impulsion um, that you had to get them to connect to you and get them to really, really seek the contact. And if it felt a little heavy, rather than thinking, oh, it feels heavy, think supple it instead of think, get them lighter. Um, and I think that's a good takeaway for me because I often get my horses maybe a little too light and then they're a little false in the connection. Yeah. Yeah. So um, give us maybe an exercise or a couple of exercises that you would use to sort of take that, that connection that might be a little bit too strong and to supple it. What, what, mm -hmm. uh, what helps you with that idea? Well, in the canter, um, we used a lot of work on the circle, um, a little shoulder in and especially some haunches in in the canter to really get the horse to truly bend through its whole body and not just in the neck. Um, and then to get them certainly connecting to the outside rein, but really focusing on the equal contact in the two reins um, and using the lateral work and especially haunches in in the canter and then the collection to make them sit down behind so that they carry the weight more behind and therefore they get lighter in front um, but through you making them supple through their body with these changes, little bit changes of bend and then things like shoulder in to haunches in 
um, to maybe a working pirouette and haunches in to get them to really sit and carry the weight. Um, and then eventually when they were made more supple through the, uh, lateral work in the trot, uh, through shoulder in and, and half pass, um, then when they were really even in the contact to hide the transitions into passage and then eventually into pia, um, again, for the same reason to get them to really sit and collect and therefore the contact would become quite light and definitely the horse would be in self carriage, um, through focusing on getting them to really sit down behind, but not ever thinking about getting them off the contact in front, um, which is just kind of sounds a little bit like semantics, but it makes a big difference that they're still really seeking the hand, even if they are very, very light in something like Piaf, you know, the, the most collection that we're going to ask of them. Okay. I mean, it sounds a little bit, a little bit complicated, but I mean, we're, I think we're just talking, <laughs> talking about, you know, having a really good connection, no matter whether you're riding, you know, extended yes. trot or, or collection, right? You don't want to collect so much yes. that you, that you hollow the horse a little bit and have, you know, a really nice feeling in your hand, but no horse underneath you. I think, you know, it's about that idea mm-hmm. of having a, a lot of power, right? And then doing mm-hmm. stuff with that power, not just riding straight lines, but but yes, getting the horse definitely. to curve on the lines and, and maintain the, the sort of connection that you want. Yes. And then with the younger horses, you know, I mean, when you're not dealing with things like pirouettes and piaf massage, but with the, let's say, the four-year-olds that I rode, um, then just riding transitions, um, especially trot canter trot transitions, um, and then serpentine lines and really getting them to bend through their whole body. He always made quite a big deal about getting me to focus on getting the horse to really bend through the whole body and not just in the neck with sort of a holding back and really, really using the corners. Again, his indoor arena is 20 by 40. And I think that would surprise some people in America to have a big, super busy training barn, just have a small arena. But um, it's the same at Balkan halls and Balkan hall and and Ollie said the same thing to me. They were like, no, I wanted it 20 by 40, so you had to ride more corners. And I think that's um, that's a good way to look at it. You know, you you really use the corners as a suppling exercise and start teaching the younger horses early on through suppling exercises and then through transitions to make themselves more um, elastic, both laterally and longitudinally. Yeah, I think it's it's about forcing the horse to bend, you know, all the time, and and not giving so much straight lines, and and the rider then has to really think a lot more, mm-hmm. you know, about setting the horse up and turning, and then you know riding a few strides, and then setting up and turning always, again and again and again, right? So I want yeah. to ask you, Eliza, um, maybe you could give us a, a takeaway or two that you that you got from um, Verdin. And and then from Aachen because those are two uh, unbelievable shows to be able to uh, to go and observe the Europeans and and so what 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 did you experience there and what did you take away from those shows? Um, yeah, it was really interesting this year because there was some controversy. There was a lot of controversy. Of those, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. with both of those shows. Um, but one thing that was really fun to see at Fairden, um, our American representative, Andal Otts, had two horses, a five-year-old and a six-year-old, and he rode so beautifully and really, really um, harmoniously and elastically, and um, it was was really beautiful riding, and um, he came in. I was there for one of the first warm-up days, and so it's a super busy arena. Everybody's in there warming up, and um, you know, he just came in, and you could tell that he wasn't going to change his program just because it was this big time, um, show, you know, he just came in rising trot kind of quiet and stretching and, um, then gradually put the horses together. And, um, he made a very good impression and a lot of people were very impressed with his riding and, um, especially some that were complaining about some of the more front to back riding and a little bit more auction type riding, um, had a very good impression of Endel and his riding. So I thought that was especially nice for us as Americans to have such a good representative there. Um, and I also got to watch, um, you know, there's a whole CDI at Fairden with the, with the big tour as well, the 
Um, and Hubertus Schmidt won one of the um, classes there. I think it was sort of the developing Grand Prix class. And that was also, I just love watching him ride. So that was, again, really impressive to see the, the harmony and the um, partnership between he and that stallion and the suppleness and expression that he can get out of that horse without force. Um, so it was fun to see those two and frankly, to contrast it with some of the other riding that was not so nice. Um, but in general, the takeaway that I have ha- that I had this time and I've been once before to Fairden is like the quality of the horses is just mind blowing. I mean, you know, every time I always go and I think, Oh, like I thought we had some really nice horses. in that mm-hmm. and I'm like, they're just the quality of horses is just incredible. It's gotten so so amazing, and I think that's awesome and that's really exciting. But it also makes for an even bigger responsibility on the part of the rider to um, be careful and do a good job developing these incredible athletes um, and not pushing for too much too soon, etc. Um, so it was interesting to see that at Fairden. And then at Aachen, I got to see um, the top, you know, all the top combinations there in Europe. And I got to see for the first time in person, um, Charlotte Duhardin and Vallegro, which was just amazing. Hmm. Um, and my takeaway there, even though there was such controversy with that show with Total Lux, et cetera, um, my takeaway was that really the, the top of the top and the ones that are doing the best, um, I think the riding is beautiful and harmonious and I watched a lot of the warm up and um you know Charlotte and Carl both are just incredible to watch and their system is so fair and understandable looking to the horse and um then so many of the other riders too you know I think sometimes when something like that happens um like what happened with Totalus and with the tongue of undercover it really ruins it for everyone else because I I just sort of wanted to shout to everyone that was just talking on and on about Totalist. Like there were so many other people there and they were doing such a beautiful job. And um I don't want to throw everyone under the bus under the label of competitive dressage as being cruel and <laughs> awful, et cetera. So I think Charlotte and Carl were beautiful riders, and Michael Eilberg, also from Great Britain, was lovely. Tina Wilhelmsen was absolutely lovely to watch. Isabel Verrett, of course, is always amazing to watch. Um, I mean, I'm not going to remember all of them, but there were so, so many. I think the vast, vast majority was very impressive, very kind, um, very harmonious. So I hope that that still continues to get awarded in the show ring, which I think it will. And the younger German combinations of Jessica Vandal and Christina Spreya, also so impressive. Um, and I just hope too, that that, that gets as much attention as the negative stuff. So. Yeah. I guess that's just a little bit of, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of media created stuff. I yeah. mean, you know, it's a, well, what do they say, you know, the controversy sells papers or gets headlines yeah. and, and gets attention, you know, there's got to be something, right? Because, you know, a show where everybody does awesome and, you know, it's, it's not very, you know, you can't write a lot of articles about that, yeah. you know, they got to write yeah, on yeah. somebody yeah. about something, you know, so I think there is a little bit yeah. of that, but you make a very good point about it's detracting from all the wonderful riding that's going on and all, all the awesome horses are that are, that are out there and, and uh, and competing and getting amazing scores that we haven't seen in the past ten years. So um, yeah, yeah, that's a very good point, Eliza. I, I, I'm glad that you sort of t- took that away rather than all that negative stuff from from yeah. those two shows because there was a lot of news out there and a lot of negative talk about you know uh, every once in a while it seems like you know there's at the young horse show that there's and then it gets you know the people get on about oh riding young horses too hard, too fast, too soon, you know, when sometimes it's just an example of one, one or two horses or, you know, one rider Mm -hmm. that's, you know, and all the other horses, there's, you know, how many horses in a class in the five-year-old class? It's like 40, right? So, you know, nobody talks about that, you know, but it's, and that's really a shame, but, um, I guess that's the way it is, right? 
<laughs> I don't think you can get a, I don't think you can get away from that, right? You know, like like I said, yeah. about, you know, about garnering attention and, and having to, you know, yeah, to yeah. People I mean, to people love to stuff. find the negative. Yeah. So, but it was it was definitely, um, especially at Aachen, I was I was just so impressed with the majority of the riding and the training there and fun to see some people that I had never seen in person. A lot of people that I had never seen in person and some that I had never heard of, you know, you always go to something like that and we're not being from America, very aware of, you know, maybe the Swiss riders or the Finnish riders or something like that. So it's always fun to see new horses, new combinations. Yeah. Well, Eliza, your experience is, it sounds like it was once in a lifetime and we could probably talk to you all night about it. And um, (laughs) thank you so much for sharing your experience. And and it really sounds like it was one in a million. And um, so how can our listeners, if they have any more questions about your training or what happened in Germany, how do they find you online? Yeah, I have a website, um, Eliza Sidnor Dressage dot com and I did a blog while I was in Germany so I wrote pretty much every day about my lessons there um, some pictures some videos um, and so they can find me there and then on Facebook Eliza Sidner Dressage uh, I update that page pretty regularly as well and there are links to all the blog postings on Facebook as well fantastic thanks Eliza thank you This tip brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, the shoulder relief girth that Reese and Philip both love. And here's why. The saddle fit solution you have been waiting for is finally here. TotalSaddleFit.com is proud to introduce the shoulder relief girth. This strategically shaped girth actually moves the girth line of your saddle back over one inch, thereby freeing your horse's shoulders from the saddle. Traditional girths pull saddles up against a horse's shoulders and often over the top of the shoulders. The shoulder relief girth's recessed ends allow for the billets to buckle into the girth farther back to give your horse unparalleled freedom of motion. We are so certain that your saddle will fit better and your horse will be more comfortable that for a limited time we are offering a 30-day, 110% money-back guarantee. If you are not totally satisfied with your shoulder relief girth, send it back for a full refund plus 10% of the purchase price. Don't wait. Order now for the best saddle fit solution available. At totalsaddlefit.com. Visit totalsaddlefit.com. Well, this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce Christina Vinios. She just won in a great style the Developing Pre-St. George at the National USEF Finals. Christina, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. We're excited to have you. And and I saw Folkstone or Baby Huey, right, Uh, (laughs) win in Chicago. It was fantastic. So can you tell us, to start the interview, a little bit about him? Um, he is nine years old. I got him from the Oldenburg auction when he was four and, um, we didn't expect to get him. It was kind of spur of the moment, um, luck. Um, so it was a great surprise that we ended up taking him home and, um, yeah, he's been really, really a good boy from day one. (laughs) I'm really lucky. Awesome. And he is, how big is he? He, they said 172 in the auction book, and so I write 17 too, but that might be fibbing a little bit. He might be a little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the under, yeah, he, he's, and you're a tall lady too, but he's a big boy. Yeah, his, his neck is set on pretty high, which is kind of nice for um, what we do, so um, I think it makes him look a little taller, but he's not that wide, which is good. <laughs> Yeah, no, you ride him beautifully. So, Christina, we were talking as we were getting ready for the show about your trainer tip, and that's why it was really uh, important for us to talk about your horse because uh, you do ride him so well. So what is your total saddle fit tip of the week? Uh, My tip is about having a reaction, getting a reaction from your horse 
And, um, you know, when you, when you want to go, he goes, when you want to stop, he stops. If you got to go sideways, you move. And, um, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of, a few really great trainers. And that's kind of one thing that keeps being, uh, really important. Um, I remember when I first started riding dressage, I was watching Robert Dover teach a lesson and this woman, she, he said, go more forward because his number one thing was forward, forward, forward. If you don't have forward, you can't have anything else. And so she squeezed him and nothing happened. And so he said, kick the horse. And she kicked him and nothing happened. And he was pretty much like, your horse should be in lots of hatches by now. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, so I never forgot that moment. Um, so that was kind of. You know, on the other side, I remember um, I trained with Stephen Peters for a while, and he was also equally important on having breaks. Um, he would get on Huey and say, oh, we, we don't have breaks today, or talking about the breaks um, as, you know, equally important as going forward. So um, for me, I sometimes I say, oh, he feels so good. I'm having such a great time. And then I sort of forget to keep checking in and asking him questions and keeping him on his toes. And since he's so big, if you don't stay on top of that, you really feel like you're sometimes you're carrying him around the ring and that's not so easy. So um, (laughs) it's when I remember to do it, then it's really helpful. So for example, this morning I did my warm up, and then I went, I was like, all right, I'm going to do a great, big, long, easy half pass left. And so I started going after three or four strides. I was not going sideways anymore. And so I sort of took a few steps back and said, okay, let me do a little leg yoga, let me do a walk pirouette, and just kept asking questions to get him really reactive. Um, and then it was a lot easier. Christina, would you characterize your horse as being lazy? I would not. He's generally really forward, which I love, which is a good thing. Um, but like we said before, sometimes he didn't want to um, come back. He, the break part wasn't working so well, so or it would work, but then he would, you know, become disengaged or something. And we want him to really use his hind end and not just slow down, but collect. So I would not say he's lazy, but um, almost the opposite, which is usually a good thing, but sometimes can be work against us. (laughs) So Christina, talk to us. You said, you know, I ask him questions and, and check in with him. So tell us, what does that mean? What are you, what are you doing when you, when you're asking those questions? Um, just trying to keep him paying attention to me. And so maybe I go forward a few steps. I go back a few steps. I maybe ask for a little, outside flexion once in a while but not even so that the outside person can see it just so that I know I'm doing it and he's sort of staying with me um yeah he kind of he's a big boy and he's sometimes tries wants to do his own thing and if you're not kind of keeping him paying attention to the like a kid in school kind of paying attention he'll sort of get distracted or something like that and so and I also most of the time he feels really good. So I am just having fun and going along. And if you sort of forget to ride, then it can um, get more difficult. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying you basically check in every couple of strides, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And maybe and you think... don't do a huge transition, but you do, you know, just a couple steps or something. Just to yeah, and I think, yeah. I think that's so important. You know, um, that I think that's really what you're saying is you need to be riding every step and constantly asking Mm -hmm. him, can I go forward and can I come back? And I think that that's a huge, a huge deal. What would you say, Phil? Yeah, I I say that in my lessons, you know, all the time. And I say, like, a dressage test is not the person who can go around the rectangle the, the most you know, the longest without the head popping up or something, you know, it's about doing stuff, right? You've got to do a circle here. You got to do a transition there. You got to, I mean, they pack the, you know, the higher you go up through the levels, the more they pack in your, into your five or seven minutes or however long your test is, the more stuff. So if you, your mm-hmm. regular ride is just sort of, 
you know, I get on and I trot around for 10 minutes and I do 15 circles this way and I do 15 <laughs> circles that way. And that's not what it's about. That's not going to help you at all. You know, you got to be sharp yeah. and you got to be, you got to be moving the horse this way, moving the horse that way, stopping him, rein back, the, the, you know, putting, but that's, that's tough to do on a, on a daily basis because so often we get so focused on concentrating, is the trot good? And when the trot is good, sort of letting the horse do that, but you can get into a rut by doing that. And horses get into a rut by doing that because they get used to just, you know, I just do a long side, then I do a short side, then I do a long side, then I do a short side and they get sort of, you know, in the pattern of, of doing the same thing all the time that, that uh, we have to make sure that we're riding them and, and doing lots of stuff and keeping it interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Christina, are there any other exercises that you do to kind of keep uh, baby Huey, you know, with you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple. Like, usually in my warm-up, I do um, the rubber band exercise where you're on a 20-meter circle and you ask for uh, lengthening in the trot on the open side of the circle and then come back. And just even in the canter, I do that also. In the beginning, usually just a couple steps. Are you paying attention or does it take me five strides to bring you back? Um, and then do you bolt out of there or do you, you know, gently come out like I'm asking? Um, but that just, it sounds really simple, but just to make yourself do it, <laughs> it's, yeah, you have to be pretty disciplined. Um, so I like that exercise a lot too. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think that that's actually at the root of everything for any sport horse, stop and go are the most right. important things. <laughs> and they're really, really hard to do. You know, you think, uh -huh. oh, this, that sounds so easy, um, but it's not. And and I think even all the way up to Grand Prix and, and in your case, winning the developing pre-St. George on, on big scores, you're saying that that's still one of the most important things that you work on. And I think that that's a good, a good deal. So, um, I, you know, I think that that's kind of the takeaway message here is that you have to ride every step and you have to keep your horse with you. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's a fantastic description. Yeah. So, Christina, thank you so much for coming on the Dressage Radio Show. How do our listeners find you online? Um, I have, I'm on Facebook, Christina Vinios, and um, I'm working on my website. But you can always email me at christina.vinios at gmail.com. And how do you spell Vinios? V-I-N-I-O-S. Perfect. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Well, that was an awesome tip from Christina, and we love it. And as always, we love emails and Facebook shout outs. Always feel free to send it to Phil and I. We love them, and we try to uh, work them into the show. So you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me at philipparksequestrian.com and my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week for allowing us to put on a show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back and we will talk to you next week. 